before we begin, if you like this video and the type of content I create, do consider supporting me on Patreon. In doing so, you'll gain access to behind the scenes screenshots as I work on my reviews, have your name appear at the end of said videos, and for top tier supporters, you'll not only have your name read aloud in the videos, but also gain early access to them one week before they get released on YouTube. Thank you very much for watching, and on with the video. So, here we are, the finale to the classic series of Thomas and Friends. Series 7 not only holds a special place in every fan's hearts as the last of the era, but is also widely remembered as quite the oddball to the franchise. The first of those reasons I want to mention before anything else is the production schedule. Now up until this point, Brittlecroft Productions slash Galen Entertainment would always leave a decent amount of time between each series release, presumably to give both themselves enough time to film with the models and keep their fingers on the pulse of the show's ever-growing popularity. More so with the UK releases, given it was a UK-based show first and foremost. Series 2 aired in 1986, two years after Series 1 aired in 1984. Series 3 would air a whopping six years later in 1992. Series 4 waiting not as long to air, three years later in 1995, Series 5 following suit three years later in 1998, and Series 6 despite the huge time and effort spent by the production team on Magic Railroad would also air in a short time of four years later after Series 5 in 2002. Which by the way I didn't realise until just recently that means Series 6 is turning 20 this year. Damn, now I feel old. So yeah, there was always a lengthy amount of time between each series release. But then comes series 7 with I think what is the shortest release window between series by just a year, airing in 2003. I mean, in theory, that sounds great. It means the show's audiences and fans wouldn't have to wait as long for new episodes to be released. However, a short release span can leave the production crew being incredibly crunched for time and thus, Shortcuts would have had to been taken in order to meet the deadlines. So why did Series 7 come out so soon? My guess is when Hits took over in 2002, just before the release of Series 6, they already had their vision and plans on what would become Series 8 ready to go the second that they gained the show rights. But by the time they did, Ghislaine would have already started planning their vision on Series 7 and already be too far into the production process that they couldn't scrap it without losing a shit ton of money, i.e. David Mitten would have already probably had some storyboards and concept art drawn for sets and shot compositions, the sets themselves would have already started to be constructed, Mike and Junior would have beta versions of their new character themes, etc. So Hit probably just said, eh, fine, let's just get this one out of the way so we can start our plans as soon as possible. The production team should have had way more time to be able to work on this series than what was given to them, especially given that they would want to put their all into their last series on the show. But yeah, this would be the last time the Thomas stories would be produced under the same company that had dedicated nearly 20 years worth of work into keeping it going. The last to have an a four and a half minute runtime with its episodes, the last to use the original theme song and intro that had been used since series 1, the last to have music composed by Mike O'Donnell and Junior Campbell, and the very last to be directed by David Mitten. Seeing as he decided not to return, both because of going into retirement that same year, but also because of behind the scenes frustrations dealing with Hit giving him next to no creative freedom. How Series 7 was handled here in the UK was one thing, but how it was handled in the US? <laughs> I will save that for later. So, with another 26 episodes and quite a hefty production cycle, how did it do? 
Well, before, I never watched any episodes on VHS and DVD, and had vague memories of seeing these series on TV, and even then I never saw it fully. Episodes like The Grand Opening, and Harold and the Flying Horse, I have no memories of seeing as a kid. Therefore, watching those two specifically for this review series legit felt like I was watching them for the very first time. And now having watched all of Series 7 fully, and after watching the other six, plus one movie, where do I stand on Series 7? Personally, I thought Series 7 was way better than Series 6. Like, obviously nothing compared to the other stuff, god no. In fact, Series 7 is responsible for having some lower lows compared to Series 6. But it's also responsible for some higher highs, and I actually struggled a bit trying to pick my top 5 favourite episodes from Series 7. But before I get ahead of myself, let's see how these stories hold up and deliver with entertainment. This is probably the most laid-back series of the classic era. Very slice-of-life episodes that aren't very theatrical or full of adrenaline. There's a couple of action-packed moments that for the most part deliver on the thrills while still being a relaxing kids show, but a lot of Series 7 is very calm and tranquil. I hesitate to say it's uneventful and low on energy, more so for those who loved the previous series for its dynamic, high-octane chases, races and runaways. <laughs> you see what I did there? But I welcome this. Stories like James trying to stay clean while taking a dirty old barge to the workshops, Peter Sam looking for a new spot for the refreshment lady to set up a new tea shop, or new character Murdoch looking for some peace and quiet only to be blocked by sheep, they all have that early day Audrey style of writing. So it's very comparable to the energy of Series 1's more eventful stories like Thomas and the Trucks, Toby and the Stout Gentleman, Off the Rails, etc. True, they don't stick in your mind nearly as much as Series 1 does, but their laid-back energy is nice. There's also instances where you can take them more seriously compared to last time, specifically with how there are multiple stories to do with a storm. Edward's Brass Band, The Refreshment Lady's Tea Shop, Toby's Windmill, and Salty Stormy Tail each have a storm that takes place on Sodor, and each are on different parts of the island. Almost like it's the same storm, but we're seeing it from different characters' perspectives. Granted, it's never directly stated anywhere that these Storm episodes all take place at the same time, but it's also never stated that they don't, if that makes sense. It allows you to connect the dots on your own ideas and when they might take place, turning on that creative side of your brain. So I'd just like to add an editor's note while on the subject of Toby's windmill, but the shed that he's staying in is not the same shed from his old railway, like I originally said in my Series 6 review. Why am I not losing my mind over such a change to Toby's old line, previously thought to be closed down since Series 1? I really hate myself for making that mistake that could have been resolved with just a simple wiki search, and I would like to tell my past version to get f***. With my favourite of these stories being Salty Stormy Tale. I mean, battling through a storm on the coast with new character Fergus, only to be stopped by a lighthouse keeper who needs to turn the generator back on before a ship out at sea hits the rocks, using Fergus's flywheel to do so. This feels like a direct visualisation of the kind of story Salty would tell the other engines, and it's really entertaining. One of the few times this series in particular delivers on the actions and thrills, actually. One more great accomplishment of Series 7 is just how well they balance out the stories between the standard gauge engines and the narrow gauge engines. Something that I didn't bring up in Series 5 and 6 was how they handled the stories on the Skarloey Railway. As after their debut in Series 4, where they took up over half of the first episodes, I think the production team struggled to think of how to incorporate new stories about them into the show again. In Series 5, we had 23 episodes on Thomas and the other engines, with the small engines making brief appearances. Then the last three stories were focused on said narrow gauge engines. Duncan gets spooked, Rusty and the Boulder, and the Snow. This did lead to the end of Series 5 feeling a bit... Uh, anticlimactic, as it never really got a big series ending finale. But just a story where Rusty tells Thomas about a time Skull Lowy was buried in the snow. The same applied to Series 6, with the last three stories once again being focused on their railway, Duncan Duncan, Rusty Saves the Day, and Faulty Whistles. 
Again, no real climactic or big event story to close off the series. Instead, we just got Duncan losing his whistle and has to rely on the Headmaster's organ to replace it, which funnily enough was based on the railway series story Mike's Whistle on the small engine railway. Neither this nor Snow are bad stories by any means, but it did make series 5 and 6 feel, if you binged them, like I did, they'd fizzle out towards the end. Very similar to how series 4 ended with those severely underwhelming, but far from terrible Christopher Audrey stories. Which is unfortunate given their mostly great flow from episode to episode, more so with series 5. Series 7 improves upon this and instead of putting all their narrow gauge stories at the end, spreads their 6 episodes out across every 3 or 4 episodes of the bigger events, therefore leaving a chance for the production team to deliver a finale episode that closes off the series properly. And it kinda does, kinda doesn't. Three Cheers for Thomas is not a climactic, grand story of all the engines together, but instead just about Thomas wanting a sports day medal. So has a race with Bertie, only for Thomas to leave the race in order to collect a box of medals for sports day as not to disappoint the children, to which one of the boys who won an event gives him a medal as a thank you. I feel like I should be disappointed in how even with a chance to make a magnificent closure to series 7, they didn't really do that. But I can't dislike it, for two reasons. One, unlike the Audrey-focused series, there's no instances of stories building on top of one another as it goes along, so in the end, it feels like they can get away with a simple one-off story to complete the series as they have no ongoing plot lines to close off on. And two, the race itself, and the UK version of the episode as a whole for that matter, features an instrumental arrangement of one of their songs from series 4, Let's Have a Race a song that was directly tied to Thomas and Bertie's first race back in Series 1. I thought that this was a nice little inclusion. Seeing a song travel from a one-off music video based off the show to being brought into the show itself is really cool. It's not as good as how series 1, 2 and 3 ended, but it had a better ending than series 4, 5 and 6 did. Or at least with the episode that was chosen as the ending. More on that later. Looking at series 7 as a whole, however, there are some unfortunate glaring issues. I'm talking about the morals again, and... <sighs> the subtlety is getting weaker with each series. Nothing brain dead or effortless, as it's still mostly presented in an entertaining way. In fact, there are even some occasions where there are no morals and it's just seeing nice or funny things happen to characters. Like Edward's Brass Band, where Edward has an accident and nearly misses out on taking the band to the concert, only to help them when they get stranded in the middle of nowhere when Bertie gets stuck in the mud. Or Best Dressed Engine, where Gordon doesn't want to be decorated for May Day, but ends up getting a banner stuck across his face and boiler and unintentionally wins the Best Dressed Engine competition set up by the engines. There are indeed some good stories in Series 7, but a lot of messages are starting to feel very obvious. Mainly with the episodes that end with characters apologising with the message of the story spelt out either by other characters or the narrator. We shouldn't have been so naughty, said Bill. We're very sorry, added Ben. Good, smiled Fergus. From now on, we can all do it right together. We're sorry, Henry, said Thomas. We didn't think you were really sick, added Percy. I'm sorry I played a trick on you, said Thomas. Thanks for owning up to it, replied Arthur. Maybe spotless records are made to be broken, smiled Thomas. And then mended again, finished Arthur, just like friendships. You gave the children a wonderful trip. You really are a very useful engine. Oh, thank you, sir. Puff Reneus proudly. Reneus didn't feel like a little engine anymore. We're sorry if we hurt your feelings, puffed Thomas. We were only copying you because we think you're grand. Then say no more, me arties, replied Salty happily. Now they will all work together and have fun together, as good friends should. As for the returning childish elements, well, some episodes I could take more seriously than Series 6, but there are some others that are definitely... out there in terms of writing. 
Grineus and the Roller Coaster, Snow Engine and Harold and the Flying Horse are the biggest examples that come to mind when thinking about the played down to kids side of things. The first one being about Reneus feeling like he can't make a school trip around the railway exciting and special, only to have a runaway down a bumpy mountain line, which looks no different than how it normally looks, so what's the danger? It feels like it's meant to be going for the same played for laughs energy as Thomas the Jet Engine. It even has the William Tell Overture runaway theme again, but in the end it just comes off as too wacky for a character like Reneus. According to concept storyboards, the episode was originally with Peter Sam as the main character, which would have explained how his dialogue was written in this story, seeing as the gallant old engine himself did feel out of character with him being unsure of himself. How can I make the children's day really special? The second being about Oliver having a disdain for snow and not seeing the magic that Toad sees when a group of children built a giant snowman for a winter festival only for him to have an accident and end up crashing into the snowman itself. It's not a bad episode and I do genuinely like the ending with the children deciding to make fun of the situation and to dress up Oliver in the snowman's clothes, as well as this wholesome little line. Oliver was so relieved that suddenly he didn't feel cold anymore. But the sight of an engine crashing into a snowman is a little bit... Uh, silly. And in the third one, a cart horse named Pegasus gets stuck in a ditch and has to get to the village fate but instead of just helping it out of the ditch, Harold carries the horse through the sky all the way to the fate. There are several things dangerous with this image, and it's played to be whimsical, but like what if the rope snapped? What if Harold turns sharply and Pegasus slides out? What if he moves slightly and that's what causes him to fall several feet to the ground? D -d Do you want children to see that? Oh ho, don't worry kids, Pegasus is only being held high in the sky, ready to fall to his inevitable death. The Grim Reaper comes for all of us in the end, even Greek named animals. It's been kind of disappointing seeing both the stories in this and in series 6 not be told as well with its morals and include very childish elements. Like, I get that as the series goes on, it gets harder and harder to top the stuff that you did before, but it's just a bit of a letdown seeing the series decline in quality. Like, the show has and always will be aimed at kids, but that should never be an excuse to cheap out. Like, just because you're guaranteed to constantly bring in that young audience that will watch anything regardless of actual quality, doesn't mean that you shouldn't leave something for them to want to come back, like good writing and storytelling. Like, with Series 6 and Series 7, they still tried, but absolutely. In fact, given how little creative freedom Ghislaine supposedly had when working on Series 7, I'm happy that they managed to deliver some competent stories in the first place, but the end results feel less like something that we'd get in Series 1 to 5, and more like something that we'd get on a Sunday morning kids show that they just watch on their iPad on mindless bus journeys. I'm just going to go ahead and say it. Series 7 is the best series of the classic era to introduce brand new non-Audrey characters better than how Series 6 and Series 5 handled theirs by a long shot. Not necessarily because they're all better characters than ones like Cranky or Salty, but a lot is done with them to make them memorable and impactful to the series. There's so much I want to say about all five of them, so I'll go through them in order of their first appearances in episodes, starting with Emily the Sterling Engine. Emily is definitely a first for the series. She's not the first female engine in the series, but she's the first female steam engine. Her debut episode was the very first episode of series 7, and wow, what a great episode it was. Emily's New Coaches is a nice little story that sets the tone for the rest of the series to come, and does a great job at introducing a new character. As it's her first day, she wants to make some new friends during her first job. But, because she takes Annie and Clarabelle without knowing they are Thomas's coaches, everyone thinks that she's doing it out of malice, and they don't reply when she whistles hello leading to her feeling very upset and already alone on what's supposed to be a new life job for her. 
Only when she saves Thomas later from crashing into Oliver on a level crossing do the engines realise that she's not a bad engine and immediately start welcoming her to the railway once she gets her actual new coaches. After that episode, she starts to get comfortable where she is on Sodor and different sides of her character are shown. In What's the Matter with Henry, she shows worrying concern over Henry feeling ill when everyone else doesn't notice and thinks he's just being lazy, and has a sweet moment where she helps him back to the docks when he eventually breaks down. What's the Matter with Henry is also just a great episode in general, where Henry is in great pain from leaking tubes and yet still presses on doing his work with determination. What a unit. Then in her next major appearance in Salty Stormy Tale, that caring nature is what causes her to see Salty upset from Thomas and Percy copying his mannerisms and the way he speaks, so she sternly tells them off. Such a well-written character and a fantastic new addition to the series. Fergus the Railway Traction Engine is also a great new addition, but only for his first story, Bill, Ben and Fergus. I like his no-nonsense approach to work and trying to be professional by constantly telling the twins to DO IT RIGHT! Which makes sense he'd get on working better with Mavis's more sensible attitude. Man, she's really grown since her Series 3 debut, hasn't she? But in the state of danger when Bill and Ben accidentally cause an avalanche, even if they were being as rough with pushing the rock crusher as possible to spite him, Fergus without hesitation rushes in and pushes them out of the way. What a great guy. He reminds me a lot of how Duke treated Stuart and Falcon in Series 4. Admittedly, I'm not too keen on how Bill and Ben act so recklessly around unsafe rock walls, given their experience with rock slides in Heroes, but that's the only problem I have with them in this episode. Everything else is very much in character for these cheeky twins, and the episode is great for introducing Fergus. But then we come to Fergus Breaks the Rules, and immediately he regresses as a character. Not at first, he's still his stern and professional self when ordering the returning Diesel around the cement works when he behaves unprofessionally, but when Diesel lies to Fergus that the Fat Controller wants him to work at the scrapyards instead, not only does he believe someone who is clearly terrible at his job and untrustworthy, but when he gets scared by the appearance of Ari and Bert, his instinct is to… run away? Like, it's established that Fergus has been around for quite some time as the pride of the cement works, so if he's a grown man, why is he acting like a child? Overall, I really enjoyed his character, I'm just a bit put off by the strange inconsistency. And no, I'm not going to take points off him and never appearing in the series again after this, seeing as the reason why he wasn't brought back was because when filming the rock slide, the rocks damaged the flywheel on his model, so he couldn't be used again. If they could have brought him back, they would have, is what I'm saying. Arthur is next, and damn, another memorable new addition to the show. In his first episode, he stated to have a spotless record, meaning he's never had an accident or been silly. But that doesn't mean that he is snooty or holds himself above others. When Thomas encourages him to join in with him and Percy in bumping the trucks, he doesn't go on a rant about how that's bad behaviour or how it's beneath him, he just smiles and says, no thank you. It's like he understands some engines enjoy being childish and respects that, but he wants to keep his record. Which is unfortunately ruined when Thomas plays a trick on him, getting him to try and stop the trucks from sinking, which annoys the trucks who then cause Arthur to crash into the back of Duck, ruining his record. You'd think that they'd let that whole spotless record thing be the one thing tied to his character and leave it at that, right? But no. In his next episode, Something Fishy, we explore more about him. Arthur is still new to the railway and likes exploring the island to see new locations. He discovers the fishing village and he absolutely loves the place. The Fat Controller wants to set up a fish train that runs along the line from the fishing village. At first, he chooses Thomas, much to his annoyance as he hates fish, which makes sense given his history. He sends Arthur to work taking coal to the steelworks, even though he'd much rather do Thomas's job. When Thomas has an accident with the train, Arthur comes to the rescue, delivers the fish on time, and the Fat Controller sets him as the permanent replacement on that fish train. So now he finally works on his favourite part of Sodor. Like, such a sweet and endearing character. One episode we learn that he's mature and doesn't like misbehaving, but is still friendly and polite. And in this, we learn of his appreciation for the things that other characters don't see much beauty in. One of the greats, for sure. Murdoch? Even though he doesn't have much I can say about, he's still a good character. His design is cool, and his character persona of a gentle but irritable giant who doesn't like the bustling noise of the main yards is something quite unique to him. 
I even really enjoyed his interactions with Harvey and Salty. What's the longest train you've ever pulled? Have you worked Marseille? Have you ever crashed? Please, Murdoch chuffed. I want some peace and quiet, and I don't want to share a shed with chatterboxes. No need to be rude, huffed Harvey. But just like Harvey, he appears as the main character of one story, a side role in another, and then never appears again throughout the series. However, I hold him in higher regard to Harvey, as he actually speaks more than Harvey did in Series 6, and has some unique, if brief, interactions with other characters. He's not too shabby. Spencer, the private engine to the Duke and Duchess of Boxford, is a fandom-loved character, and his series debut, while only one episode, is iconic. We essentially get introduced to a character who becomes a rival to Gordon, where if one slips up or makes a mistake, the other will find hilarity in teasing them for it with no sympathy. Which is actually what sets them apart. Spencer is boastful and pompous just like Gordon, but is actually more arrogant and less sensible. He pretty much represents Gordon's character at the beginning of Series 1. The only difference is Gordon has gone through several misfortunes that have humbled him over time. He still gets boastful and defensive of his image, but he's still more mature than Spencer. So when Spencer runs out of water on Gordon's hill, even if we know Gordon isn't 100% reframed from not being boastful, he's still the hero of the day bringing him and the Duke and Duchess to the party. The fact that Spencer, like Emily, became a series regular used right up until the show's end should go to show how great a character he is, and this episode is a great example of that. One thing I love about the new characters is that they mostly stay in a shed at Knapford, separate from the sheds at Tidmouth that we've seen since Series 1. Yes, they can still stay at Tidmouth, but it explains where the others would sleep if the berths become too crowded. I really like this about the classic series in general. It refrains from cramming in every main character into one place, or having the risk of others being sidelined for the sake of having main leads to follow and allows for varied character interactions depending on who is staying in the shed in the episode. It's such a shame that the hit series never followed through on this, but one thing at a time here. Now for our returning favourites, and... <sighs> Again, we have some inconsistencies. I've got to hand it to the writing team of Ghislaine Entertainment for keeping most of them consistent when bringing them into their own stories. In fact, the best thing Series 7 does with its characters, old and new, was make sure every character got some focus, either as a side role or an episode to themselves. The first seven characters we've had since Series 1 each get an episode to their names, as do the narrow gauge engines that were given upscale models, so does Harold, Bertie, the Great Western engines, more so with Oliver, Donald and Douglas, the newbies from Series 6, the newbies from this series, Bill and Ben, even some old returning characters like not just the aforementioned Diesel, but even Bulgy but that still can't save Series 7 from its inaccurate characteristics. The old bridge is the one every fan points to as the biggest example of characters downgrading. In this story, Scarlet Lowy has an accident where he ends up dangling from a broken bridge over a river. After he's lifted to safety and the bridge is mended, he is sent to collect his trucks that were left at the bridge, but he's suddenly really scared about crossing the bridge and refuses to do so. I understand that they were trying to write a story about PTSD and facing your fears, but it doesn't work because you're taking a character that's been portrayed in the past as a confident, wise, manly leader, only to be regressed into a timid and helpless child. The hit series did this character regression much worse, but this was an unfortunate sign of things to come. Then you get the regression of Reneus, as I mentioned before with his Spotlight episode, then Thomas, who, while he is still his Series 5 kind self, his appearance in the Spotless record has him being a bit too much of a prick to Arthur. Donald and Douglas suddenly start believing in the Loch Ness Monster in Bad Day at Castle Loch. Duncan, after his character arc with Rusty in Series 4, goes back to disliking Diesels again in Trusty Rusty. Or Percy, who's thankfully not as dumb as he was in Series 6, but still has his moments like when he too starts believing in the Loch Ness Monster. Surprisingly, he actually has an episode where he's quite smart and competent. He notices the unsafe tracks out on the branch line, but nobody believes him, leading to Thomas getting stuck and left out in the rain until nightfall, where Percy comes and rescues him, and the Fat Controller apologises and admits he should listen to him more from now on. After the disappointment that was his Series 6 regression, especially in Percy and the Haunted Mine, Percy Gets It Right was such a breath of fresh air. 
Another example I want to spend some time talking about is the return of Bulgy. While I can let it slide that he's become a bit friendlier, given spending years in a field on his own to think about what he's done would do that, I don't understand why the engines are happy to see him back after he tried to steal their passengers. I, I can understand Emily being kind, she doesn't know of anything that he did, but why is Thomas being so friendly to him? Believe it or not though, like that's the only issue I have with this episode. Bulgy Rides Again is one of my favourite stories from Series 7 just because of what they do with Bulgy. He's still grumpy and impatient, and while he's happy to be carrying passengers, that doesn't mean he likes them. He never did like them before in Series 3. Stupid nonsense, he grumbled. I wouldn't have brought them if I'd known. I'd have had a breakdown or something. He said he was a railway bus, but he wouldn't accept our return tickets. He gets brought back into service, but the hens that used to sleep in him creep on board at night and fall asleep in the luggage racks. So the next day, when he sets off with passengers, only for the hens to wake up and cover them in feathers and eggs, they all blame him, so he tells the other engines they can just have his passengers back. Instead of going back to being used as a hen house again, however, Emily says that a local farmer needs help selling his vegetables, which he thinks sounds like a good idea. So he gets repainted and turned into a mobile vegetable stand, and he actually really enjoys his work. I like this episode a lot. While the returning old characters do have their very, very off moments, I feel they're about on par with Series 6 with how they're handled with characterisation, so not too bad. And Series 7 definitely has the most range when it comes to equal character appearances. The production side, however, Christ on a bike is there a lot to talk about. Series 7 has the biggest count for use of stock footage in the entire classic series, and I mean THE biggest. Up until this point, reused shots in episodes were only very brief. They became less and less frequent going from series to series, to a point where series 4 managed with little to none. Even series 5, with all of its reused shots, still had plenty of its own original footage, so not every episode had recycled scenes. Series 7 not only drastically goes back to repeating footage from its own episodes, but the footage it uses from Series 1 to 6 really sticks out. It repeats itself more than a goldfish with Alzheimer's. Sometimes they even use inconsistent footage to stories, like this shot of Peter Sam in Bulgy Rides Again, from an episode where he had his old funnel, and this shot of Henry from the beginning of Not So Hasty Puddings. It's the scene from Series 1 where he pulled the flying kipper over the viaduct, not only really inconsistent because he's in his old shape, but with a really tacky and stale snowfall effect. While I'm on that episode, by the way, this has what I can certify as the worst transitional shot of the entire classic series. Here it is. Now, Thomas was crosser still. The snow was heavy, but Thomas arrived at every station right on time. A transitional shot is supposed to you know, transition from one place to another. By cutting to this clip from the Series 6 episode, It's Only Snow, Thomas has a completely different train, is wearing a completely different snowplow, and while the changed clouds look seamlessly different, Toby is seen behind Thomas but is never addressed, and then we just cut back to this shot looking nothing like it. Like, that was so tacky. It's just so jarring going to old footage that's not only meant to be filmed in a different aspect ratio, but also filmed so differently to Series 7. The overall look and aesthetic of Series 7 to me is miles better than Series 6 at least. The colour palette is more rich, the lighting is better, and the sets are more interesting. My personal favourites being the countryside in Percy Gets It Right, the windmill in Toby's Windmill, and the fishing village, but still nothing compared to Series 3, 4 and 5, and the more times shots from said series are reused, the more glaring those comparisons become. There's also a few goofs in the episodes that I think are mainly to do with the production order of how they were shot. Basically, Series 1-6 to was mostly aired in order of its own episode production, something you can kind of tell with how the first few episodes of each series take place in smaller locations while saving the bigger sets for later, as they were probably still building those sets at the time. 
In fact, something that I only learned recently was that the first 16 episodes of Series 3 that were given early dubs were originally going to be the only episodes released for that series until they had the money to film the last 10 that had drastically different changes to the sets and engine props. I can't remember exactly who it was that taught me this information, but if you know who you are and you're watching right now, you're awesome. Series 7, when it first aired back in 2003, had some episodes where characters are seen working in the background who hadn't been introduced yet. Arthur is seen working in Bill, Ben and Fergus way before his debut episode, Spencer is seen in the background twice in Something Fishy, and Murdoch is right there in the foreground when he's not even meant to be there yet. Like, somebody definitely made a mistake there. Which you can kind of see them trying to fix that with the 2010 Series 7 DVD, where instead of being released in the order of the airing date, like the other DVDs, they are released in their production order, where the episode Gordon and Spencer plays longer before Spencer makes background appearances, and Murdoch's first episode, Peace and Quiet, plays longer before his appearance in Something Fishy. But there's still more problems, like the narrow gauge episodes randomly together in groups of three rather than being equally spread out across the series, or all the episodes with Emily in them playing before her first episode where she first arrives on Sodor. Again, maybe it's because Hit was very adamant to get Series 8 out as soon as possible, so there wasn't much time to get a consistent episode release order. I'd be very interested to know the full story of what happened back in 2003, what with the order of the series that was meant to be released. For the music side of Series 7, for Mike and Junior's Departure series, they left the show still being as consistent as they've always been before. Their music matches the laid-back tone that Series 7 went for, though there is one thing that bothered me with the sound side of things, which I'm not sure if it was Mike and Junior deciding to include this, or if it was a note from the higher-ups. But every so often, a crash is met with a very childish-sounding sly whistle. Squashed fruit flew everywhere. There is! I'm guessing this was a way to make the accident seem more cartoonish, but then why would you do that? The whole appeal of the accidents in the show beforehand was that they were supposed to be taken seriously. Yeah, you get those one-off accidents that were meant to be funny, but the others were still taken with some sense of dignity. It's nothing that plays too much down to kids, but it is slightly annoying, as were the other childish sound effects. But instead blew mud all over Gordon. There's also, once again, some songs and music videos. Uh, I have no memories of these compared to the others, but let's just say, having seen and heard them now for the first time, while the original or deleted footage looks very pretty, the songs themselves to me are either just okay, Just not that great. Also, just as a side note, what is it with these weird animated parts during the videos and the use of random dancing garden gnomes? 
Are you actively trying to make me remember Percy and the Haunted Mine? If so, I fucking hate you for that. Michelangelo's narration is... interesting to say the least. While he was notably very energetic for the early series and carried that out over until series 6, for this he seems once again inconsistent with his character voices. Ah, enjoyment is all you engines live for. One day railways will be ripped up. I'm being repaired. I'm going back on the road. And on top of that, he feels very whispery and quiet. I, maybe a bit too quiet, which I didn't think was possible for a relaxing kids show about talking steam engines, but just have a listen. When Scarlowy arrived, he saw the trucks on the other side. One day, Thomas and Percy were helping Salty at the docks, but Salty was worried. And for the first time, Fergus broke the rules. He's still good, don't get me wrong, but I'm just not too sure about how this strange choice of tone in his voice came about. He also makes some very weird one-off noises. Meow. <coughs> Even James was impressed. Mm. However, if you grew up in the United States, you most probably remember Series 7 not only sounding different in terms of the duration, but also sounding different in terms of music and how it was aired on TV. That, my fellow viewers, is something that I have saved for its own section. The clumsily produced US dub of Series 7. The way in which Series 7 was brought into the States was... questionable. By this point, Shining Time Station was a thing of the past and the show had since then been shown in America via VHS tapes and DVDs. After Series 7 had been broadcast in the UK at the end of 2003, 2004 came around, and that was the year Hit wanted to air their own take on the show, Series 8. That series was set to debut on Nick Jr. here in the UK and PBS in America, marking the first time the show had been broadcast on the channel since Shining Time Station ended in 1997. But obviously they had to get Series 7 out in America first, so on March 16th, I'm guessing while Series 8 was still being filmed, they released an American exclusive VHS and DVD with four of Series 7's episodes, and for some reason included the Jack and the Pack episodes from Series 6. New Friends for Thomas and Other Adventures would not only be America's first exposure to Series 7, but also their first exposure to Michael Angelus as narrator. This would have been around about the time Alec Baldwin had left the show and before they would choose a new narrator for America, so the only other option was for Michael to redub those episodes with the American terminology we'd seen before with Series 1 to 4, with Ringo Starr and George Carlin, and for Alec Baldwin with Series 5 to 6. Thomas was excited. The Fat Controller had sent him to collect a special from Jenny Packard. Thomas was excited. Sir Topham Hatt had sent him to collect a special from Jenny Packard. Soon Murdoch was coupled to a long, long line of heavy trucks. Soon Murdoch was coupled to a long, long line of heavy freight cars. Like with Ringo in series 1 to 2's US dubs, it was very surreal for me hearing Michael read these stories with American terminology, and while the narration editing isn't too graceful... What a mess, Puff Thomas. Sir Topham Hatt was very annoyed. At least it was making use of what they had to get series 7 out before series 8. Narrating the others and trying to get the dubs greenlit before Series 8 was due to air internationally would have taken so much time that they probably didn't have. However, if releasing Series 7 straight to VHS and DVD via Angelus redubbing it with American terminology was the only way that they'd be able to get Series 7 to America before Series 8 was shown to them, I'd say they should have gone for that option because the way that they decided to broadcast the rest of Series 7 in America? Fuck me, does it get weird. During the half-hour airings on PBS and Nick Jr., a couple of episodes of Series 7 were broadcast in between episodes of Series 8. Mike and Jr.'s music was completely cut out, and the episodes were given new music by the composer for Series 8, Robert Hartshorn, and for American audiences, was dubbed by Series 8's eventual hired US narrator from then onward, American actor Michael Brandon. 
the order would go the hit series intro and theme song, a series 8 episode, an animated or original footage learning segment that were introduced for series 8, a series 7 episode, another learning segment, and another series 8 episode before closing off with the roll call song. Which I will save any mention of the song itself for series 8 in the summer because listening to it will cause me to dive headfirst into a pool of thumbtacks. But yeah, what a weird way to bring Series 7 into the States. Like, I understand they want to make the changes so there wasn't a whiplash of going from Series 8 to 7 during the broadcasts, but then why broadcast Series 7's episodes in between Series 8 episodes in the first place? They'd released some Series 7 episodes with Michael Brandon's narration and the original music intact as part of the other US exclusive VHS and DVD, Thomas the Jet Engine and other adventures. So why not do the same with the others? And why would you also do the same in the UK? We already had our version of Series 7 back in 2003, so why are you showing it to us again? It even means that on some occasions the Series 7 episodes that do get broadcast this way could potentially have up to three versions. Salty Stormy Tale even gets four. The 2003 UK dub with Mike and Junior's music, the 2004 US dub with Mike and Junior's music from the Thomas and the Jet Engine VHS and DVD, and both the US and UK versions that aired with Series 8 on PBS and Nick Jr. with Robert Hartshorn's music. If the production for Series 7 wasn't so rushed, then I believe the plans could have worked out like this. Series 6 comes out in 2002 when Hit takes over. In the meantime, use 2003 to focus on distributing Series 6 to the US via DVDs and VHS sales, as well as focusing on the sales of toys and merchandise, and not being crunched for time trying to find a new American narrator for the series after Alec leaves. 2004 comes and Series 7 comes out in the UK, and having had more time to be worked on, the final results would have less stock footage and no rushed production elements like inaccurate characterization. 2005 becomes the year you debut Series 7 in the US with the American narrator who has the time to read the stories without rushing them, and it also has the music from Mike and Junior still intact giving you time that year to shoot what you really want to succeed with Series 8, so when 2006 comes around, you make that the year Thomas airs on Nick Jr. and PBS simultaneously. The UK gets Series 7 without it being rushed, and the US gets Series 7 without it being sandwiched in between episodes that are of a drastically different format and style. There! I fucking fixed it! Even though it happened 18 years ago and it can't be changed, but you know what? I made myself a fucking badge for it. To see the differences between each dub, I actually binged the entirety of the US dub of Series 7, and... Eh. Michael Brandon isn't the worst at narrating these stories. He even attempts to give characters their own voices, which is something Alec barely did in Series 6. Yeah, not every voice fits the characters, and it leads to him making some very weird sounds. <laughs> How am I going to make the Children's Day really special? Look out! And he could also be inconsistent with the terminology. He's here to shunt freight cars and pull freight. Thomas and Percy were bumping freight cars. The troublesome trucks, troublesome trucks, troublesome trucks, trucks, troublesome trucks, trucks, troublesome trucks, the troublesome trucks, troublesome trucks, trucks. But I hold him in a higher regard than Alec because, as rushed and unfocused as he sounds, I can get used to his narration because at least he feels like he's trying. As for the new music, I'll be damned when I say that it's really good. In fact, dare I say on some occasions, it's better than Mike and Junior's music. Not all of the time, far from it, but following up the composers who wrote the iconic tunes of the classic series is a tough job to handle and I think Robert did very well. One episode in particular I think he did better than Mike and Junior with is What's the Matter with Henry? The scene where Emily notices Henry's tubes are leaking water when he isn't feeling well feels more serious with Robert's music. But Emily saw that Henry was leaving a puddle of water behind. She was worried. But Emily saw that Henry was leaving a puddle of water behind. She was worried. And while I really like Mike and Junior's remix of Henry's theme used when Emily helps him to the docks after he breaks down, a part of me actually prefers when Robert dubs this scene with his own take on Emily's theme. I feel like doing that, it feels like more of a character moment for Emily rather than Henry, and thus she feels more involved with the episode. Oh, thank you, Emily, wished Henry. <laughs> 
Emily and Henry puffed into the docks. Oh, thank you, Emily, wished Henry. Emily and Henry puffed into the docks. I'll talk more about Robert Hartshorn's work when we get to the hit series later down the road, but Emily's theme by Robert is actually my favourite piece of music of his. It's just that Mike and Junior's music would have been left in place had Hit not fucked up the production cycle, and Robert wouldn't have had to worry about composing Series 7 at all. But yeah, that's how Series 7 was brought into the States. A very weird thing to happen to the show, and the only time something like this ever happened to the series. But at least they didn't have to build another show from scratch to distribute the show overseas in the first place. I'm actually going to go through these lists very quickly in one section, as I've already talked mostly in depth about why I dislike or like these episodes before. So it doesn't drag out the review longer than it needs to be by means of me repeating myself. Just know that each bad episode I consider above the bad episodes of Series 6, and the good ones I think are just below the ones from Series 1 to 5. So, very briefly... My bottom five episodes. Number five, Trusty Rusty. The bridge collapsing into the water is cool, and it's nice seeing Rusty be a hero, but seeing Duncan's arc with Rusty being ruined by him going back to disliking Diesels for no reason whatsoever really rubbed me the wrong way. Number four, Fergus breaks the rules. Seeing Fergus immediately start acting like a child after being established as an older engine is very odd. And Diesel feels like he should have had a bigger role to play, what with his third return to the railway here. Number three, Harold and the Flying Horse. The way in which Harold takes the horse off to the fate is incredibly ridiculous, and the overall plot itself is just very skippable. Maybe because, again, I don't remember watching this as a kid, so I'm not very nostalgic for it. Number two, Reneus and the Roller Coaster. This series really does have a thing for making wise old characters behave like children, doesn't it? It's made to feel like a wacky, crazy runaway, but ultimately I'm left feeling a bit bored and wondering when the next episode plays. Number one, The Old Bridge. Easily the worst in how it began the trend of Scar Lowy becoming a helpless young wimp. The message can be taught well with this story, just not with this character. Maybe you could have tried to swap Scar Lowy out with somebody like Duncan or Peter Sam, or even use this as a chance to introduce Ivo Hugh into the show. But yeah, the worst episode of Series 7, definitely. My top 5 episodes. Number 5, Percy Gets It Right. Again, watching a Percy story like this immediately after Series 6 felt like a godsend. And on top of that, it actually delivers on being an intense search and rescue when he goes looking for Thomas. Also another episode where I prefer Robert's music. Number 4, Salty Stormy Tale. Salty's best episode from the classic series that actually delivers on a serious story for such a laid-back series like Series 7. Fergus thankfully feels more in character in this with his side role than Fergus Breaks the Rules, and the moral may be forced at the end, but far from ruins my love for the episode. Number 3, Emily's New Coaches. The best episode for introducing a new character that would become a part of the main fleet from here on out. It sets the tone for the rest of the episodes following, and feels the most like we're seeing an Audrey-style character be introduced as possible. Number two, What's the Matter with Henry? My favourite character's only main episode in this series, and it's a great one. Reminds me of his series one self, pushing on to pull a heavy train despite his aches and pains. His scenes with Emily are also just really sweet. Number one, Something Fishy. Just a great little expansion to one of their new characters, and the crash is both cool and intentionally funny to see, uh, depending on which music you hear playing when you're watching it. Despite not having much screen time, Arthur is such a solid new addition to the series that I wish we got to see more of. Series 7 is definitely the oddball to classic Thomas. While better than Series 6, it's still nothing compared to what else came before it. The heavy technical problems with the overuse of stock footage and character-specific episodes appearing out of order, the very not-so-subtle use of moral storytelling, and the return of the oh-so-lovely childish elements with character inconsistencies, it lets the series down big time. But with its character diversity and range, the improved sets and colour palettes from last time, the best new characters not taken from the Railway series books, and great music from both dubs, there's a lot to love. 
In fact, I'd go so far to say that if Ghislaine had the time to work on this series without stress under Hit's ownership, this could have been something fantastic. What I love about Series 7 the most is that, though it's the last of the iconic era, it feels no different to every other series. There's no grand send-off or emotional goodbye as if it was going to stop, because it wasn't. The show we'd grown up with was still going to continue on, just with a different style. And regardless of Series 8's actual quality compared to Series 7, or the rest of Hit Entertainment's series for that matter, this was a nice way to transition into that era. Nothing was going to top what they did in the golden years, so they closed off with simple yet memorable stories with their heads held high, ready for a new chapter to begin. Series 7 wasn't perfect, but it was a great ending to an era that has and always will be iconic to fans who grew up with it, or those who will discover it for the first time today. Whether it's the careful, humble beginnings of Series 1, the wonky-eyed beautiful spectacle that was Series 2, the experimental gem with controversy that was Series 3, the back-to-basics beautiful scope of Series 4, the cinematic-style rollercoaster that was Series 5, the nostalgic ugly duckling that was Series 6, the last hurrah of classic Thomas that was Series 7, or even the fascinating disaster that was Thomas and the Magic Railroad. Their charm and creativity was all thanks to the fantastic people who worked on them, some of which are no longer with us so we could thank them for making our childhoods, but what they left behind was something magical. The classic series is over, but their presence in the hearts of fans young and old so many years later never ends. And after all that, not only are we done with this era of the show, but we're also done with the epilogue to my Thomas and Friends Review series of last year. But I am genuinely going to move on to other projects this year, as well as actually take a break from the series. I just really wanted to talk about series 6 and 7, as well as capitalise on just how well my other reviews were actually doing. As of the time of recording this video, all my reviews of last year have gained over 1,000 views, and my channel has gained over 200 subscribers, which is... It's absolutely fantastic. All I can say is a massive thank you from the bottom of my heart, and I hope that I can continue to deliver on the type of content that you like to see for my channel. So, have a good morning, afternoon, evening, whatever time you're watching this. Please do consider supporting me on Patreon. And I'll see you next time.